Uh, joining me from the museum is Chris Goforth. Uh, she's actually with the research session. She's head of citizen science and joining us from, I'm not even sure where you are, Clyde, but Dr. Clyde Sorensen, uh, entomology professor at NC State. And uh, he's somewhere in the field, so I'm sort of envious of that. So anyway, so we call ourselves the Carolina Ghost Team. And so we're going to talk about fireflies and, and zero in on the uh, ghost firefly, a little bit more detail. And uh, Chris Goforth is going to start things off with an overview to give you some great background about fireflies as we begin our subject. So Chris, I'll let you take it away. All right, let's see if I can get my screen to share here. Having a few little issues. Um, all right, can, can you all see my Yes, we, we see okay. your presentation. So, Perfect. It's always fun when uh, your tech is not working exactly the way you want. Um, all right, welcome everyone. So excited to be here tonight and talk about one of my favorite groups of insects. Um, I uh, do have an entomology background, um, but have always studied aquatic insects. So fireflies are actually a fairly new thing to me um, because I used to live in the western part of the U.S. where there aren't very many species that light up, um, but they are magical and I hope you love them as much as I do. So I'm going to introduce them um, as kind of a group and then I'll pass it over to Clyde who's going to tell you a lot more about a particular group of uh, fireflies that we're really interested in you all helping us actually document um, in more detail. So let's meet the fireflies. So one of the things that I always like to start with is what a firefly actually is. Um, I'm constantly surprised by how many people don't know what fireflies actually are. So just in case you don't know, and you probably all know this, but just in case you don't, um, fireflies are um, insects. So they are, um, you know, they've got the standard insect body plan. They've got um, a head, a thorax, an abdomen, six legs, two antennae, four wings. Um, and they're a particular type of insect. So they belong to the beetle group, the um, order Coleoptera. So they have uh, modified upper wings. Um, so their, their front set of wings are modified into this kind of hardened structure. Now they're not as hard as a lot of other beetle species. They're a little bit more flexible, a little bit more, more soft, but they're still definitely not the just kind of membranous wings that most other insects have. Fireflies belong to a family together, the Lampyridae, and these are the um, the insects that that can light up. Um, there's a few other insects that can also bioluminesce, um, but fireflies are uh, a pretty major group that a lot of them are capable of lighting up. So just a few characteristics of the fireflies in general as that that family Lampyridae. They've got um, soft bodies. Their their bodies are really pretty pretty squishy and very flexible compared to a lot of other beetles. I mean, if you've ever held a ladybug, you know, they're just, they're really, really solid little beetles. Uh, and the fireflies are a little bit, a little bit more bendy, a little bit more flexible. They do keep their heads kind of tucked under their, their thorax here. So this, this section here is called the prothorax and their heads kind of tucked down underneath that. They have five tarsi or toes on each, um, each feet or each foot. So they've got, um, if you count from this joint out to the end, they've got five sections there. And then many of them have light producing organs. There are some fireflies that don't light up. Um, they're considered like the dark fireflies. Um, so not all of them light up. And like I said, where I'm from in the Southwest, there were very, very few species that lit up. Um, even though we had fireflies, most of them didn't have that light producing organ. Uh, so that's still even a pretty special thing even amongst the, the fireflies themselves. So just a comparison with um, another beetle that people frequently mix up with fireflies. This is the firefly here. So you can see all the, the body parts, the, the five toes, the head tucked under that prothorax there. And then this is a soldier beetle. Um, they look very, very similar. Uh, and people in, in North Carolina in particular mix these two groups up a lot. They're about the same sets of colors. They got the same kind of flexible body. Um, but you can see with this this soldier beetle, you know, that head is really prominent, sticking out pretty far um, and is really, really obvious compared to the, the firefly here. And then when you're looking at a lot of the other beetles, you know, you're going to have that much firmer, harder body. 
So worldwide, there's about 2,200 species and about 110 genera. Um, these numbers change a bit depending on when people find new species or how they're exactly classified. Um, so sometimes they get split out into more species and sometimes they get lumped together into fewer species, but about 2,200 species uh, documented worldwide. In the US, we've got about 170 and about 10 genera. Uh, and in North Carolina, we're less certain of how many we have. Um, we know we have at least eight genera so far, but we could have more. Uh, and we don't know exactly how many species we've got in our state. Um, it's not a very huge number, but it's also not a tiny number. So fireflies have this very well-known bioluminescence uh, and I want to talk just very briefly about how this works. If you want more details, you could probably ask Clyde a lot more um, nitpicky kinds of things than I can tell you about it, but basically it boils down to chemistry. Uh, they have in their abdomen uh, a light producing organ and it's basically mixing a few chemicals together with some energy put into that reaction. And so they, they've got an enzyme and a chemical that are interacting with each other with some energy, and then they're producing this light. And they have this very, very, very efficient light. If you think about when you have a, a light bulb on, your lights get hot. Um, that means that the light producing um, reaction is not very efficient because a lot of that energy is being lost as heat. And in fireflies, you don't lose as much heat. Um, they have very, very limited heat that is um, produced, and almost all of that reaction goes into actually producing that light. So let's talk a little bit about why they light up. Um, fireflies are either crepuscular, so they're active at, at dusk usually, or nocturnal, so there are some species that wait until it gets full dark before they start lighting up. Uh, and you might be curious why they're lighting up if they are animals that are in the dark um, you know you're advertising to a lot of other animals that you're out there so there's a few different reasons why they light up uh, one is that they use this to communicate with each other and so you have um, these small animals that are trying to find each other in the dark and lighting up is a good way to advertise to other members of your species that you're there and in particular members of the op opposite sex in your species. So we have males and females talking to each other with this light production. You also have an ability to advertise your unpalatability to other species. So fireflies have a lot of pretty nasty chemicals in them that are not so great for things that want to eat them. Uh, so this is really kind of why it's okay to light up if you are a firefly. You know, you are letting every other animal out there know where you are by flashing this bright light out in the dark. Um, but if you're full of pretty toxic chemicals, you can also use that light to advertise that maybe you shouldn't eat these particular insects. And then there are um, a few instances where you have cheaters, and I'll talk about that here in just a moment. It's a really, really awesome system. So the communication is really kind of a call and response kind of thing. So you have generally the males flying and they are flashing a particular pattern that is um, specific to their species for the most part. So they're flying around flashing this light and what they're doing is looking for the females that are mostly stationary sitting on vegetation usually flashing the, the correct response flash pattern. So you've got all these males flying around, looking in the grass, looking in the trees, uh, depending on the species, for the, the females of their species and looking for that particular flash pattern. And so they're able to talk to each other pretty effectively in the dark. You've got all these different flash patterns depending on the species that you're looking at. So these are three that are really uh, famous in the, the mountains here in North Carolina. Um, Clyde's going to talk about the blue ghosts in a bit, so I won't talk about those. Um, but the Fotura species tend to be these kind of larger um, fireflies. They have um, what people consider like a flash bulb, or they're sometimes called Christmas light fireflies or paparazzi fireflies. Uh, they tend to have um, single flashes or small numbers of flashes uh, and look kind of like, like flash bulbs. And then the one at the bottom is uh, called the Big Dipper or the J Flash um, or the common Eastern Firefly is another name for it. There's lots of common names for that species. Um, that species is one that's very common here in the triangle and the males are going to light their light organ. They'll dip down, leave it lit as they fly upwards and produce that kind of J shaped greenish flash. 
A lot of times the color can tell you a lot about which species you're looking at as well. So both the flash pattern and the color uh, can tell you a lot about you know, which firefly you're looking at. I did mention cheaters a few minutes ago. Um, so this is one of those um, Forturis uh, fema um, females. They're significantly larger than most of the other fireflies. And what they do is they sit in the vegetation and they are looking for the call of males from another species. Um, and they can flash the female response call for that, that species that they're, they're looking to attract. And basically what they're doing is luring that male in so that she can eat them. Uh, and it's thought that they, um, they don't have as many of those chemicals, those protective chemicals in their, their bodies that the other fireflies do. And so they need to get those out of the environment so that they can pass it on to their, their young. And so by eating those, those males of that other species, they're able to actually get some of those chemicals in. But it's a really, really cool thing that they're mimicking the flash pattern of females of a different species to lure those males in to eat them. And then they've got their own flash pattern that they're going to flash to attract um, the males to them. So really, really cool fireflies. They have giant eyes. They're, they're pretty big. Um, but a really amazing group of fireflies. But they're not as amazing as the ghost fireflies. And I'm gonna hand it off to um, Clyde so that he can share a little bit more about those. This All right, I'm gonna- I can find my, my end share here. I'm gonna try and share yeah. my screen and we'll see if that works. Mm -hmm. It may or may not. Um, let's see. Are you seeing anything? It looks like my slides. Uh, not yet. No. OK. Give it a minute to load. Let's see. OK. OK. Um, it's not let me say allow. OK, let's see. Entire screen, allow. Look, it's, it's doing something. Yep, we see it. We see your computer. Yep, there it is. You got All it. All right, so you got my slides. Yep, got your first awesome. slide. That's great. Okay, right. great. All right, so I'm going to uh, talk to you about some really, really cool um, little fireflies um, that we call ghost fireflies. And um, let's see if this is going to work now. OK, um, to get this started, uh, I need to kind of familiarize you with the pieces and parts of a firefly that are important when you're trying to identify them. Um, so uh, variations in these pieces of a firefly uh, can be really important when trying to sort out who it is you're looking at. Um, so everybody should know fireflies like other insects have a pair of antennae. They have a pair of compound eyes, and in most species of fireflies, the eyes on the males are much larger than the eyes on the females. And uh, in fact, in some species, they're basically their entire head is just two huge eyes because their whole mission in life is looking for little dim lights <laughs> of females. Um, uh, Chris told you about the pronotum, the prothoracic segments, the segment that carries the first pair of legs never has wings and the top plate on the prothorax is called the pronotum and the shape and the color and sometimes the presence of windows in that uh, pronotum can be really informative when you're trying to sort out a, um, a firefly. Right behind the pronotum, the top plate on the middle thoracic segment is called the scutellum. And a lot of times the color of that thing can help you identify a firefly in hand. And then uh, the elytra are the front uh, wings of the beetle that um, that Chris was telling you about. And of course, in, in uh, fireflies, the color, the markings, uh, sometimes the shape of the elytra can be real informative. And the, uh, many fireflies also have what's called an elytral fold uh, and the presence or absence of that little wrinkle along the side of their elytra can sometimes help you identify a firefly. Now, the, the group that we're going to talk about, the ghost fireflies, belong to the genus Phalsis. 
And this is a curious bunch of mostly tiny fireflies. There are at least 10 species in North America. And I say at least because frankly, we don't know how many species there are. And in fact, um, what we're asking y'all to help us with is the potentially describing the range of a species that's never been described by science. So uh, most of them are, again, really small. The males are going to be a quarter of an inch or, or less long. Um, in this genus of fireflies, the females are wingless and look more like larvae than they do adult beetles. And I'll show you a picture in a little bit uh, of what they look like. Uh, and um, in all the species, the females have light organs. And uh, that the number of light organs they have uh, could range from uh, two to sometimes as many as nine or more um, light spots. Unfortunately, you really can't count these light spots unless the critter is alive. Once, once uh, she dies, or if you were to collect her and put her in alcohol, you can't determine how many light spots she has because there really is no way to visualize them. Now, of the 10 species of known uh, Falsus fireflies in North America, um, only two are known to have lights, uh, light organs on the males. And the rest of them are what we call dark fireflies. So in the rest of those uh, 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 species, that other eight species that we know about, um, the males don't light up. And um, they basically, uh, when they're looking for mates, basically fly dark um, over the forest floor looking for the dim lights of the females. The most famous of the Falsus fireflies is the blue ghost that we find up in the mountains of North Carolina, the mountains in the foothill. And that, uh, that species scientific name is Falsus reticulata. So I'll talk more about uh, uh, the blue ghost in our cool little weird undescribed whatever it is in a few minutes. But first, I wanted to go through kind of the basics of the life uh, cycle for most of these um, uh, ghost fireflies. So um, in most of the species, the females will emerge from burrows that they spent the winter in in, in the ground. Um, and they'll come up uh, in the spring or early summer, depending on the species. And they'll only come up um, typically for maybe as many as three or four weeks. Now, one of the species we know, uh, the blue ghost, has two peaks of uh, emergence. But we're not quite sure we understand exactly what's going on with that. So the females come up, and at the right time of the night, they put their little behinds in the air and they turn their lights on, um, usually sitting um, in the leaf litter near the, uh, near the entrance to their burrow. And the males will be flying at the right time of night about one to four feet off the uh, surface of the forest floor um, looking for females. And if they see one, um, they basically drop uh, to the ground as close as they possibly can to where she is. And then they run over um, and uh, try and convince her that they're a fit mate. If there's multiple males see the same female at the same time, there'll sometimes be a little ball of males fighting over that one female. After she mates, and she may mate uh, more than one time, after she uh, finishes mating, the female uh, will generally lay one batch of eggs, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 eggs. And then uh, she lays these in the soil and then she curls her body around them and guards them until she dies. And then typically the eggs hatch uh, a, a short while after she's um, deceased. And frankly, we don't know a whole lot about the larvae of any of the Faustus, um fireflies. Um, but Almost all other fireflies, and we think all the Faustus fireflies, are predaceous as larvae and feed on uh, other little animals that they find in the soil where they live. And we think it takes them about a year to complete their life cycle, to go from uh, an egg-laying female um, this year to an egg-laying female next year. 
But again, we don't know uh, uh, that much about many of, of these species. All right, so this is Faustus reticulata, the blue ghost of the mountains. And I'm showing you this because there are some important differences between this insect and the one that we've been encountering here in the, in the, in the, in the Piedmont uh, of North Carolina. So if you look at uh, this critter, um, you'll notice that the pronotum is really oval. It's got a large dark mark that kind of goes up towards the front margin of uh, the structure. And then it's got these clear windows so that it can see above its uh, head while it's flying, uh, as well as looking down where the females are likely to be. Uh, notice the wings are kind of a uniform kind of brown uh, color and they're covered with little tiny uh, seedy or hairs. And in this uh, genus, the shape uh, of the antennae and the segments of the antennae can be important. So if you look at the belly of a male um, blue ghost, this is what you see. Again, notice those massive eyes and you can see through the windows on the pronotum as well. So it's got these massive eyes. It doesn't have much in the way of functional mouth parts. They don't, we don't, as far as we can tell, eat anything as adults. And then here are its light organs. Um, and so these are the structures that are responsible for the kind of unique uh, uh, light uh, pattern that blue ghosts have. And what's unique about um, blue ghosts is that they don't flash their light. The males don't flash their light as they're flying around looking for females. They keep it on for long periods of time, sometimes as much as a minute, but usually at least 20 or 30 seconds before they turn it off. Now, another um, important structure on these fireflies to look at is the shape of this tail end uh, piece of their abdomen. This is called the pagidium. And if you'll notice on the blue ghost, it's got kind of a shallow, um, uh, a shallow uh, divot, if you will. So um, blue ghosts are called blue ghosts because when you see their lights uh, at any kind of distance, they look kind of bluish. But if you actually have one of them in hand and he lights up, um, what you'll notice is, is the light's actually green. And um, that, uh, uh, that discrepancy in the color in hand at a distance is due to a, a, a optical illusion um, called the Perginkia effect, which basically um, says that a, a faint green light at any distance to our eyes looks blue. And by the way, uh, this picture on the left is showing you a male blue ghost and a female blue ghost actually in the um, process of mating. And you'll notice that the female doesn't look very much at all like the male. Uh, so kind of a larva form, um, little yellow, uh, yellowish creature that's about, about the size of a long grain rice uh, kernel. So as far as we know, the true blue ghost, Faustus reticulata, is restricted to the mountains. And these uh, black uh, stars are, are indicating all the places where we've documented, all the counties anyhow, and places within counties where we've documented um, the occurrence of blue ghosts. Um, we don't know, frankly, if they extend very much further east from here. They tend to be found usually at elevations higher than about 1500 feet all the way up to 5000 feet in elevation in the mountains of north carolina um, the blue ghost has a, a first peak of emergence in may and then it has a second uh peak of emergence in uh late june and july um fading into july and we're not sure if that represents two generations or whether that actually represents two different populations that just come out at different times so some places that you may have heard of where blue ghosts are are, are kind of uh um famous uh in 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 the 
densities that they emerge uh, would include places like DuPont State Forest, um, Joyce Kilmer, um, the uh, Pisgah Forest around Brevard has several locations where um, pretty high densities of blue ghosts occur. I've seen them at Grandfather, uh, Grandfather Mountain and I've also seen them at Stone Mountain. So um, there are a lot of different places you can see them. And at high densities, they're pretty incredible. Another species that occurs in North Carolina that is very, very poorly known is Falsus inexensa. And the common name for this, if it has a common name, is the shadow ghost. And that's because this is one of those species that's dark. The males don't have light organs, just the females uh, have light organs. And in this species, the females only ever have two light spots. I should have said in reticulata, in the blue ghosts, the females may have as many as nine or 10 light spots. Um, as far as we can discern, the um, shadow ghost has its mating um, period earlier in the spring than the blue ghost. Um, and it may be widely distributed in North Carolina, but we have very, very few records of it because it's a pretty inconspicuous uh, little animal. The, the males are essentially invisible because they don't have lights. And unless you were to be looking for the females at the right time in the right place, you'd never see them. You probably wouldn't happen on them because they are uh, so um, small and, and dim. But it is important that we know that there's a, the, the second species documented in North Carolina. And so that brings us to the mystery ghost firefly. And um, this is related to some research that's been done by uh, a lady named Lynn Faust and some folks uh, from uh, Clemson. Um, and it, uh, it may or may not tie into what we're seeing here in the Piedmont of North Carolina. Uh, but there is apparently an undescribed species of glowing uh, ghost firefly in the coastal plain of South Carolina. Um, and they've only gotten a couple records uh, of it, but, um, but there is a, uh, another glowing species that's probably been uh, not described by science yet. So it's an unnamed species. Um, I'm not aware that anything has much been done with this uh, creature in recent, in recent times. Um, by the way, on this map, you'll notice the red stars. That's the distribution of reticulata, the true blue ghost up in the um, mountains of far northwestern um, South Carolina. And then that brings us finally to our mystery of firefly, um, the one that we're calling the Piedmont ghost. And if you remember the picture I showed you of reticulata, um, I'm going to ask you to just study this picture for a second and see if you can detect any differences uh, between the reticulata and, and this um, new firefly. It's not new. It's, we didn't notice it before. New firefly that we're seeing in the Piedmont of North Carolina. I'll give you just a second to look at it and then I'll I'll try and explain what I what I see as differences, both on the top and, and the bottom. So one of the things that you'll notice on this species, on this specimen, is that that pronotal shield is much lighter in color. There is no big dark um, spot kind of coming up to the front edge. And the windows in the pronotum are much larger. They basically um, encompass most of the pronotum. All right. So the pronotum on this one is different. It's also got a little bit of a difference in the shape. It seems to be a little bit wider here at the back ends. The antennal um, segments are uh, lighter in color as well. And then if you notice, the wings appear to be somewhat darker. But probably the more important differences are here on the underside. And um, what we notice on this Piedmont ghost is that one, the light organs are smaller, considerably smaller than the light organs 
on uh, reticulata. And also notice that the pedidium has a deep V-shaped notch in it instead of a shallow notch. And so all those things uh, lead me to think um, that this is quite possibly a different species from reticulata. Uh, in addition, its behavior is a little bit different. It tends to like drier habitats. The, um, the blue ghost in the mountains is usually found in, in moist woodlands, often near streams. And this critter seems to like being a little bit further up the slope in a drier kind of pine oak woodland habitat. But Jerry's going to talk more about that in just a minute. So just to give you the comparison again, side to side, this is our mystery Piedmont ghost. And this is the blue ghost of um, the mountains. Notice the antennae on the blue ghost is much darker than the antennae on the um, undescribed Piedmont ghost. And notice the difference in the maculations, the patterns on the pronotum here. And then again on the underside, notice that shallow notch here and a very deep notch here and the much light or smaller light organs. Also notice that the abdomen is a different color. So um, they're, they're, there's a high probability that this is uh, a species that hasn't been described by science. This is what the female of our mystery ghost looks like. So it looks very similar to um, the uh, um, blue ghost female. But this uh, species, the Piedmont ghosts, uh, the females always only have two light spots, or at least every one that we found so far where we could actually observe the light spots. They've only had two light spots, so they have fewer light spots than the blue ghosts. And um, in fact, that two light spot business is something they share with an excess. So this is the same creature from the side, just so you can get a, a better um, visualization of what, what this animal looks like. And this is its pronotum here, by the way. All right, so uh, Jerry's gonna get into a little bit more of this, but we've learned a lot more about the distribution of this um, undescribed species of firefly over the last couple years. And we know that there's a center of um, distribution in this part of North Carolina. We now have records over in Montgomery County. And in fact, we had a specimen uh, provided to us from a fellow in Georgia that looks very similar to Argo. So um, we've got a lot to learn about this. We we know it's here, but how much further does it occur in North Carolina? So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jerry and be glad to take any questions from you um, at the end of my, at the end of my, uh, uh, at the end of our presentation. I think I stopped to share. <laughs> yeah, you, you did. We, we got we got a quick look at your bird list there before you. <laughs> oh yeah, well that that's only part of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me see if I can share <laughs> my screen, and we'll continue our our ghost story here. Get to the right slideshow. If you will confirm when the Carolina ghost slide shows up. There you go. All right. All right. Well, uh, Chris and Clyde have already shared a lot about what we know about fireflies. And Clyde has also told you that we don't know a lot <laughs> about some fireflies. And so this is where the Carolina ghost hunt comes in. And this is where Hopefully you will come in and help us if you haven't already helped us with our ghost hunt. Now, I'm going to cover the where, when, and how of hunting ghosts, along with a few other things about documentation of ghosts. And the where is of 
let me start with the starting point. This, this unknown, undescribed, potentially undescribed species of firefly was originally only known to Clyde and maybe a few others uh, at one site in Chatham County on private property. And so this is where it got started. And of course, Clyde uh, figured that it had to occur somewhere else. So he started searching for them and you know, through social media, encouraging other people to search for them. And indeed, in, uh, uh, in 2021, with his efforts, you know, he did find them in additional sites in Chatham and a site in Wake County. And the Wake County site is Durant Nature Preserve. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that find because it has, a, it has an even a longer history. And seeing that, you know, and a little bit of a, a social media communication with Clyde encouraged me to look in Johnson County. And indeed, I found them right in the woods behind my house in Johnson County. I, I didn't expect to find them and, and sort of uh, didn't give it a serious look until I was sort of uh, felt bad about not telling Clyde that I really hadn't looked for them. But when I did look, I did find them in my backyard. If you want to hear more about that story, because you know, beer was involved and I'll tell you that later maybe. But anyway, so so this was really cool that we were finding them in these different places. So, uh, and Clyde ended up finding them in the woods behind his house too. So, so this, uh, we had this indication that this was a more, whatever it was, it was a more widespread species. And so we actually last year, 2022, we launched the official Carolina ghost hunt complete with a web page and everything. And we actually uh, yeah, started promoting it. And you really came through for us because based on the additional observations that y'all provided, in addition to some of our own last year, we have really started filling in some gaps in this map. Uh, you see a lot of a lot of activity in Wake County. As a matter of fact, uh, Raleigh City Parks contributed a lot of information uh, to what we know from their staff efforts and, and, and also working with other people to survey some of the uh, uh, Raleigh City Parks. So in addition, you know, this is a Carolina ghost hunt. So we've got one observation from South Carolina, and I don't know if we verified that or not. And then Clyde mentioned the one that's actually in Georgia, so it was off my map scale. So as far as where we want to search now, uh, there's a lot of room to search. You know, you see the, the records in Montgomery County and the Uaris, but there's a big gap of unknown between Wake County and Montgomery County. So we certainly want people to look in that area and any of these surrounding counties. We, we do not know where these occur because no one was really looking for them. They're not the easiest fireflies to detect. So, so again, the where is wherever you can look because we can't cover all of this ground. We need your help. Uh, it's a limited range of dates and a limited time period within those days that, that they are active. So we really do need your help. Now, Durant Nature Preserve actually is the probably the first known recorded observation of this Piedmont ghost firefly. Uh, and it was actually recorded about 40 years ago, but it was only recorded, as far as we know, in the mind of John Connors, who was a naturalist at Durant Nature Preserve at that time. Uh, when John Connors saw the Facebook post about looking for this Piedmont ghost, he he's about my age, so he gradually remembered, oh, I, well, you know, when, back in the mid-80s, I used to lead night hikes for kids in Durant Nature Preserve, and we used to see these really you know, dim looking uh, fireflies that, that, that he called phantom fireflies, little phantom fireflies, and he enjoyed seeing them every spring with his hikes. Uh, he didn't make think anything about it. Uh, he soon will, but surely entomologists know they're here, so he didn't say anything about it or even try to identify them. He just accepted that they were there, um, and it wasn't until 40 years later that he saw that we were looking for this, that he made that connection and he took Clyde out there and confirmed that they are still out there. So again, this this first record of this one, as far as we know, is in was in the memory of John Connor's mind. 
And, and given that this was a Boy Scout camp prior to Raleigh City Parks taking it over, I'm sure there are a lot, there's some old Boy Scouts <laughs> that probably have memories too of seeing those little faint fireflies in the forest floor. So it's a really neat story about, as far as we know, this is the first uh, recorded observation of this firefly. Uh, and if you look at this Google Earth image, you see that the woods there are a mixture of pine trees and hardwoods. You can uh, you can see that by the color variation there when you look at the, the satellite photos that are taken in the winter. Now this is the trail, this little nature trail that John used to take the kids on at night uh, to look for everything and listen for owls and that type of thing, and they would see the fireflies uh, there, uh, the little trail walking down to the uh, to the lake there. And if you go, you can look on these photos, you see this is what we call a mix, mixed woods. You see pine trees in there, you see beech trees, you see other hardwood trees in there. And of course, this is very typical of what mo many Piedmont forests look like, this mixed woods. And so they were here, you see a very rich leaf litter layer there and that's probably pretty important for preserving the soil characteristics and of course it helps I think hide the the uh, the female and, and the larval fireflies when they're you're doing their thing in the soil whatever that thing is that we also don't know very much about it so this is this is you know the where is anywhere in the state that you can find a similar wooded habitat like this that we want you to look now uh, both Clyde and I live in Johnson County. We actually live fairly close together, almost, actually less than an air mile apart. Uh, and you can look behind our houses and there are some big expanses of uh, mixed woods behind our houses too. So this is where we have found these this Piedmont form of the uh, ghost firefly right behind our house. This is my house. This is where I am right now, as a matter of fact. And that, that little blue circle there is about 100 feet in that direction from where I am right now. So again, you see the pine trees there. Uh, this is what it looks like. And of course, during the uh, spring, uh, it would the leaves would be on the trees. So this is pretty much what it looks like. Again, you see a mixture of pine trees and hardwood trees. And this is exactly where I found the uh, blue ghost fireflies when I really wasn't expecting <laughs> that I'd have them right in my backyard. And so don't assume they're not where you are or where you can look. So that's why we really want you to go out and take the time to look and help us map where these critters are. And through the efforts of, of Raleigh City Park staff, uh, Sean Go and perhaps some others have documented them in Lake Johnson Park. This is where this program is coming to you, uh, you know, from Lake Johnson Park. So they have been documented there. And again, the Google Earth images you know, shows you uh, you know, a nice areas of hardwoods and some pine trees in there. And we don't know, uh, you know, their exact requirements, but just because I think most of our in more or less older woods that we have in the Piedmont are mixed to a certain extent. But anyway, so this is sort of give you an idea of, of where to look. Now, the when to look, uh, last year we actually did this pretty much the same program to I don't know whether this is a new audience or a repeat audience, but on April 11th last year, we did a, we did a similar program uh, you know, for uh, Raleigh City Parks. And uh, we put we would put this very same word out there. And at that time, we told you that we think the best time to look is probably uh, from mid-April to mid-May. So you went out and looked, and uh, these are the actual dates that y'all actually observed this ghost firefly in our area and nearby areas. So you see that that seems to hold up pretty well. You see one blue star that looks like it's dropped below May. That's because that's a June record. And even though we think this is good to focus your efforts during this time period, again, we don't know for sure. So if you have the time, we encourage you to look before you know, this time period and after this time period. And we also don't know whether this Piedmont ghost perhaps has a second period of activity, you know, similar to the mountain blue ghost. So anyway, uh, but if you need to focus on, uh, you know, if your time is limited and you're just trying to identify where they are, then this would be the time to look. And it's not just, you know, the dates, but what time. 
So within that range of when they might be uh, flying to, to, to mate, uh, it's also a limited time in the evening of when they do this activity. So generally, they begin about 45 minutes after legal sunset. That's when it gets very dark. Remember, these are dim fireflies, so, that, so being in complete darkness is probably very helpful so that they can actually see better, or at least see each other better uh, with, their, with their signals. And we also feel, and some of the, doc, some of the observations play this out, that, that the temperatures need to be up 60 degrees or higher. Uh, so, so a warm night is better than a very chilly night like we're having tonight. And you wanna watch for about 30, 60 minutes. Uh, that seems to be when they seem to be most active. If you're in an area at night and it's been about, you've been there about an hour and you haven't seen anything, you can stay longer if you want to, but there's a fair chance that nothing's going to happen either because they don't occur where you're looking, which is good information to know too, or they're just not occurring that night. So we hope that if you are not successful one night, if you have the ability to go to the same place other nights, please do so, so that we can, you know, don't, don't, don't give up with just one, one time look, because you just may not, they just might not have been their time. They might have been on sleeping in that, that night, so to speak. So, so anyway, the, the, the math is pretty easy. So if you, if you know when the actual sunset is for your date and location, say it's eight o'clock, then about 45 minutes after sunset, you want to be in place to observe the area. And I, I usually actually get out a little bit before that because I like to, to see the topography, the terrain, while I still have a little bit of light, and then I just patiently wait for the light levels to go down. And then I usually do watch for about a full 60-minute uh, period uh, before I give up, give up the ghost of, of my ghost hunt for that night. So, so again, this is a, a sort of a narrow window. Uh, we encourage you to look, and uh, and again, hopefully you can look repeatedly if you don't have success uh, the very first time. Now, how to look for them? Well, well, I mean, it, it's pretty easy. You you just go out and you just look and wait. And and you, you could have two strategies. You could have you just go to a place and sit on sit on a log and just wait. Or if you're a place that has, you know, some trails like in a park, you could actually, during this hour period, maybe wander through the terrain uh, to observe them. Uh, when I when I look for them behind my house, I usually just stay in one place until I until I see any activity. Uh, but in some other places, uh, like uh, I found them in nearby Clemens uh, State Forest, the the forest supervisor met with me out there, and almost immediately. Uh, when it got dark, they started flying right in the picnic area there at Clemens Educational uh, State Park. And then we walked the trails after that and saw them throughout the uh, the forest there. So anyway, uh, I do go out with a red light. Uh, and the red light, the purpose of that is to allows me to see where I'm going, sort of for safety reasons, so I don't step in a hole or trip over something or step on something I don't want to step on. So the red light is just a visual aid that I use so that I can get into the forest without ruining my my night vision. You know, you need to allow your eyes to adjust to the darkness. And once they do, that enables you to see very dim objects much better. You know, if you got if you're out there for a bright white flashlight, it's going to take a while for your eyes to adjust down. And again, the this this firefly is not very bright. I mean, it's a smart firefly, but it's not uh, producing a very bright light. So, so it helps to have an aid. And, and this is a, a time lapse of me actually looking in the in the woods behind my house. And, and I just turn the light on as I need to in certain places. And sometimes, depending on what the, the, the night sky is, I don't even need to use the light here. Now, as far as what you might see, uh, let's be realistic in some expectations here. You are not going to see this. Again, remember, these are not very bright fireflies. I mean, I, I did this this with the green laser just, you know, one night when there's no activity out there uh, just for this slide. So, so have the realistic expectation that they're not going to be real bright, as you might see here. Uh, remember, as Clyde told you, they are very small 
about the size of a grain of rice and you know, a very fairly modest light organ. It's, it's very effective for what it does, but it's, it's not a really bright uh, organ. And this is a, a female. Again, you can see she's lit up and you can see the two light organs uh, in this example here. Uh, this is more realistic of what to expect. And this is an actual photo of the Piedmont ghost firefly by Deb Russell in Montgomery County in some woods near her house in Montgomery County. So she, she, uh, Catherine Hines actually helped us document those, those Montgomery County records there. So this is actually a 30 second timed exposure and you can see the trail of, again, this, this uh, ghost, Piedmont ghost firefly that we're interested in learning more about. And then this is another one of her photos that's actually 19 of uh, 30 second exposure stacked together uh, to give you all the trails <coughs> of the uh, male blue ghost fireflies flying there in search of the females who, you know, of course, are somewhere down in the uh, on the forest floor there. So, so that's more realistic in terms of what to expect. Now, remember that the females are living in in the ground there uh, underneath that leaf litter. So when you do go out searching for them, please tread lightly. You don't want to be stepping on what we're interested in learning more about. So you do have to walk through the area, but just try to you minimize your footprint literally uh, as you're looking for them. And if you are in an area that has trails, just stay on the trail because they won't be using those trails uh, for, for their, their purposes. So again, just tread lightly. <coughs> and of course, we want you to document uh, what you find in terms of where, the wind, what the weather was like, whether what the moon was 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 visible. Uh, and of course, hopefully you'll see some fireflies and document the males flying, the females glowing in the forest floor. And if you, we really want you to, if you do have uh, some that you can get to, let us know how many light spots you see. Again, these are really tiny, so you got to really get on your hands and knees and maybe get a magnifying glass to to really see uh, how many light spots are glowing, or just use your camera. Your camera, even a fuzzy picture of a, of a, a firefly will document how many spots you're seeing. Now, we make it easy for you to document this, because if you go to our website, uh, you can actually submit your observation, and it sort of leads you through the information that we want. And we really want you to do this. This is so important if you can, if you can provide this documentation, because it puts it in a database that's much easier for us to look at and to and to to accumulate all of this data. So please take the time to do this, even if you don't see any fireflies. If you searched, we would love for you to document that in our database. So that's so important. If you just go out and see them, well, yeah, you get the satisfaction to see them, them, but you don't add to our knowledge about this firefly. So this is, you know, entering data is not the funnest thing to do, but please do take the time uh, to do that. Now, what if you don't see any ghosts? Well, that is as important. Uh, we hope you do, but it's important to know where they don't occur or when they're not flying. Uh, so please take the time to document that too. And again, we hope you do see them. Uh, we hope that you can help us learn more about this really cool critter that's really been flying under our radar for a while now so we're just you know i'm sure people have seen them before but probably also thought well, well surely surely all of those entomologists at nc state know that they're out there uh but but yeah you you just never know uh so you can contribute to what we know so i want to thank you for attending tonight and we hope you'll spread the word among your friends and and you know it, it's fun to go out you know get some friends and go out go on a ghost hunt tell them you're going go on a ghost hunt uh, and contribute to science. So go to our website to get more information, carolinaghosthunt.org, and uh, it will tell you, give you a lot of this background information, and it would make us most happy if you would join us for our ghost hunt. So thank you for that, and I think I have left some time for questions. And Julie, I'll sort of let you maybe moderate whatever questions that, that, that have for any of the uh, panelists for tonight, and I will see if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> sure, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to throw those in the chat. Also at this time, if um, you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question out loud, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, 
And then I will be getting some more information from Sean Goff, who is our land stewardship program manager, on how you might be able to participate this year with um, the Raleigh Park system um, for coming out to our parks. Um, all of our parks do close at sunset, so that is something that you'll want to work with the park managers um, uh, just uh, to help us know who's out in our parks after dark. Um, we're always looking to help contribute to science. And, and I just want to add, I should have mentioned that, that, yeah, make sure you have permission to be where you want to be, whether it's a park or private land. Uh, yeah, people aren't too crazy about people wandering around in the woods near their house at dark. <laughs> well, while we wait for any questions, do you guys believe, do you guys feel, I know we're still learning a lot about the this uh, firefly, but do you feel like the warmer winter months are going to be causing them to emerge earlier? Is that something we've been noticing with other firefly species? Well, we don't really have a whole lot of fireflies that come out earlier than this one does. Um, most years, the first one that comes out is a is a critter, a critter called uh, Pyrectomina borealis, which comes out in, uh, often in late March, early April. So um, the jury's still out, but you know there have been a lot of other things that are phenologically advanced because of the the warm winter. Um, now this cool weather that we're having now, and if it persists for a couple of weeks, it may set the clock back. But um, it wouldn't surprise me if they were to become active a little bit earlier this year. And I think last year the dry weather was was not a good thing for them, the the dry spring that we had. So um, that they're lo they're like a lot of other insects. They're very they're 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 pretty sensitive to environmental conditions, I would think. And I, I would add to Jerry what Jerry said is if you do find them, it's important for you to tell us how often you find them. Um, we don't really have a good understanding yet of exactly how long a given um, population in a given site displays. We we just we we're really starting from ground zero of trying to understand this critter. Yeah, yeah. When I when I go out, I try to go out, you know, a week or two before I think they're going to to fly, so that I can try to catch the first period of activity, and then I try to at the tail end I try to. Uh, continue to follow up to see how long that that they are active. Uh, and the the one nice thing about them is that uh, the females, once they light up, they stay actually stay lit for a long time. So you even even if the males are more limited, sometimes once I find a female, they're lit pretty much the whole hour that I'm out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have a question come in. Um, do you think there'll be any overlap in the range of the Piedmont and the blue ghost uh, fireflies? Got no idea. <laughs> that would be that would be something that would be really really uh, interesting to 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 delineate. But but uh, really don't have any idea. And I mean, there is the possibility of what we're looking at is actually like a subspecies of the blue ghost. But I I, I suspect that it's not. It's actually it actually seems to be more like an extensa than it does the blue ghost. So. Um, you know, if there's differences in flight times, if, uh, um, it's possible they could overlap, but we we have no idea what to expect. And and for that matter, we should add that we're really interested in knowing more about the blue ghost as well, too. So um, any ghost fireflies that anybody finds, we want to know about them. Yep. Uh, one of our participants asked you uh, if you could remind them at what, uh, when did you say which month um, you started seeing them last year? In April, uh, about about mid-April. Mm -hmm. And then I know you guys have a form on your website. Is that just open year-round? Is it open up at a certain time? Yeah, it it, it it's open. Uh, year, it's open now. <laughs> so even, <laughs> even if you have some old records uh, that you've never got around to putting in there, if you've got some notes, please add them. Uh, trying to get Sean to add his records in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to chase after Sean then. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, we've hit our time. I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Clyde, Chris, and Jerry for joining us tonight to share that. Hopefully we can get some more really great data this year um, and get some more information uh, known about the the Piedmont uh, Firefly. Uh, for those of you that need EE credit, um, I will be sending out that form later this week. And again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I hope to see you again next month for our next presentation. Thanks, everyone.